Hello, and welcome to the 12 Days of Celtic Mythology, Season 2. Today's Day 5. This is our last look at the court list, with a bit of emphasis on the women in that list. Yesterday's talk about Gwyn at Neath was really stimulating for me to do and to research. Going over all the texts I shared gave me a lot to think about, and the discussion in the live class was also good. I asked the questions I ask because I'm a bit puzzled myself as to how we can reconcile the medieval texts about Gwyn with each other and then of course with folklore. Someone in the comments said they wondered what the earliest reference to Gwyn as leader of the wild hunt is. I like the way that person thinks. But on the other hand, folklore can be kind of kicking around in the wild for centuries before anybody captures it and puts it in a book. So I'm not sure that reference would tell us very much, but at least it would give us a not later than kind of date. I had originally planned to ask a different question yesterday. You don't need to answer this one in the comments unless you just want to share your thoughts, which you're welcome to do. And that question was about Arthur's way of resolving the feud between Gwyn and Gwyther. So what do you think about that? Is that solution to the judgment of a wise king? Stop having this war, but have a futile fight annually instead. What? And where does this situation leave Kraithalad? In a kind of permanent limbo, it seems to me. So the action of Arthur is described as Tangnevith in the Welsh text, which means something like a peace treaty or reconciliation. But in spite of the wording, it feels like more like some kind of a curse or a tanged, like the one Kilhuk's mother swears on him at the start of the story. I think I suggested in yesterday's video that I could imagine a scenario in which this action on Arthur's part is actually how Gwyn comes to have the immortality that we saw in his conversation with Gwythno Garan here, where he's talking about how he's outlived all the people who've died in battles. Maybe he becomes immortal because of Arthur's curse or whatever it is, uh, because he's fated to fight every May Day until Judgment Day, well, then he couldn't die. Someone in the comments, though, <laughs> as the pendulum swings the other way, raises a valid question. How does Arthur have the power to make this happen in the first place? I don't think we can answer that question definitively, but I think the question behind that question might have been, should we see Arthur as a deity? I don't personally think so, but he's certainly seen as a magical being to some extent. He possesses more power than your average king, let's say. But here goes the pendulum again. Because even as I say that, I'm a bit uneasy about saying it. If anybody's really nerdy and likes to do close reading of texts, It'd be worthwhile to go through Kilhoch and Olwen and look at Arthur's actions throughout the text. How many things does Arthur personally achieve? My sense of the story is that Arthur's strength is actually in the magical abilities of his war band. And it's usually one of them who achieves the quest. Here's another possible angle on the story of Gwyn and Gwyther. What if the idea of an annual fight between two magical beings or gods, Gwyn and Gwyther, is actually a very, you know, very old idea in Brythonic tradition? So old that, I don't know, maybe in the Iron Age, everyone knew an original myth. And that original myth got lost under the feet of the Romans and the Saxons and the coming of Christianity. Even if the myth was lost, there might be a memory of the annual fight that might have remained, maybe in some kind of an everyday saying connected to May Day. At some point, people look for reasons 
why ideas like that exist. They look for a story. And eventually a storyteller or a scribe will supply one. We often see this at work to explain the names of people or places, for example. The folk arrive at new stories to explain popular sayings too. So maybe that's what's happened here. Maybe Gwyn and Gwyther's fight is truly ancient, but the reason supplied here is more recent. So let's get back to the court list now, get it over with, for a look at the women who are all listed in one section together toward the end. When Kilhoch invokes his gift from Arthur, he says, I invoke it in the name of your warriors. So if we were being literal, then everyone on the list should be a warrior. But that isn't how the women are portrayed, and it doesn't appear to be intended by the storyteller that we should think that they're warriors. We know that at least some Celtic women went to war in the Iron Age. However, before we imagine you know, great regiments of women accomplished at sword play, it's likely that women warriors weren't all that common, at least not by the medieval period. We don't know really what was going on before that. What we generally see is a few high ranking women, such as widowed queens and so on, leading armies. So they take over when there's not someone else there. They have greatness thrust upon them. I'm not aware of records of noble women being trained to use weapons, but then there aren't that many records about women at all. And if somebody um, has a, like a specific citation for that, I'd be really interested to see it. Please let me know in the comments. It's certainly possible that some did choose to learn the basics. And we have lots of, you know, we have lots of mythology. When I'm talking about citations, I'm talking about like historical citations. So some women undoubtedly learned the basics, but riding at the head of an army, while it would be somewhat dangerous, uh, probably doesn't imply that our relatively rare female battle leaders were really like in the thick of it, hacking away at the enemy. As the centuries of the medieval period roll by, kings and high ranking princes also tend to lead armies, but to avoid the thick of battle when they can, because the sudden death of a king tends to cause a lot of chaos for their subjects. That's actually more wise than cowardly for a king not to get himself killed. There's so much of that in the Dark Ages, um, and that's part of the the reason there's so much chaos in the Dark Ages, so it appears, is because the kings did, you know, get into the fray and, and, and physically get into the battle. They're very brave. It's great leadership in a way, but maybe not in another way. So the list leading up to the women's section continues the typical mixture of the famous and the obscure. But just before the women are introduced, there are a couple of interesting things. There's a little story here. All means track and all with means tracker. So track, son of tracker. Now bear in mind Alwyn's name, which means white track. White flowers supposedly sprung up under her feet when she walked. So the when part means white. I'm not sure that's significant here, but it's kind of interesting. So all son of all with seven years before he was born, his father's pigs were taken. And when he grew to be a man, he tracked the pigs and brought them home with him in seven herds. So once again, we have a tale about pigs and specifically the tracking and herding of pigs through the landscape. This is an important concept in Kilhoch and Alwyn, and in the fourth branch of the Mabinogi, it comes up too. It also turns up in Irish stories. Often the pigs are enchanted humans or otherwise magical. So we'll come back and talk about pigs more later on in the series. Next, Bedwini Escob, who would bless the food and drink. 
So Escob means bishop. So Bishop Bedouin appears in a triad as well. And I wonder if he could relate to the Bishop Baldwin we met at the feast where the Green Knight appears in Arthur's court. Christians and Christian references are quite few in Kilhoch. And this is the very last man to be mentioned before we go to the women. It's not unusual for a nod to Christianity to appear like at the beginning of or the end of a Welsh bardic poem, for example. The body of the poem may feel incredibly pagan in its themes, but the first two lines and the last two lines will acknowledge the Christian God. As if it's something of a convention, or maybe it's even added in later in some cases. I wonder whether that's what we're seeing here, especially since many scholars think that the women's list may have been added a little later to the court list. Bishop Bedouin, with his blessings, may have been the original end of the list. So the opening sentence of the women's list confirms that these are not wild warrior women, the gentle gold torqued maidens of this island. Besides Gwen Huyver, chief lady of this island, and Gwen Huyvach, her sister, and so on. The disappointing truth is that many of these women have no story at all. They're just somebody's daughter or something. And you wonder whether they're just a bit of padding added in as a final flourish to the court list. Now, there are stories about Gwen Weaver, And even when there aren't, she's often placed in the room, uh, which we saw in some of the texts from the romances that I've shared, where she's sitting by a window sewing, kind of like an ornament in the picture. Gwen Weaver is also in a number of triads, and I think the triads are a good way for us to explore this. Three violent ravagings of the island of Britain. One of them was when Medraud came to Arthur's court in Kellywig in Cornwall. He left neither food nor drink in the court that he did not consume, and he also dragged Gwen Weaver from her royal chair, and then he struck a blow upon her. It's interesting how often we see Gwen Huyver receiving ill treatment at the hands of random men. You might recall the episode in Peredir that we looked at on day two, where the guy comes in and throws drink over her, takes the goblet. There's quite a bit of this in Welsh stories generally. It does feel like the storytellers are maybe looking to shock us or make people think about how women are being treated. It's also not unusual to see female sovereignty figures mistreated in stories. Three sinister hard slaps of the island of Britain. One of them, Matholach, the Irishman, struck upon Branwen, daughter of Fleer. We know that from the second branch. And the second, Gwen Huyvach, struck upon Gwen Huyver. And because of that, there took place afterward the conflict of the Battle of Camlan. So these women are blamed here for causing the battle. Interesting. And then we have cheating women, oh dear. Three faithless wives of the island of Britain, three daughters of Kilvanuad Prince Prithine, Esith, fair hair, Tristan's mistress, and Penarwen, wife of Owain, son of Irian, and Bin, son of Flamdwen. One more faithless than those three, Gwen Weaver, Arthur's wife, since she shamed a better man than any. Now, Assault, you'll probably know Penarwen. I think she's only known from this triad. Wife of Owen Ap Irian, and Bin, the wife of Flamdwen. Now, he was a Saxon leader, Flamdwen, and he was killed by Owen. And there's a poem about the battle where Flamdwen is defeated by Owen and Irian. My guess is that the idea that these women are all sisters is a flight of fancy, for sure. And the rest of the triad may be too. I think a lot of triads are. But then this is hilarious. Gwen Weaver is the worst, the most faithless, because her husband is the greatest man. So it's worse to cheat on a king than a peasant, apparently. Well, that's Gwen Weaver dealt with for now. The list goes on with lots of faithless daughters and sisters, 
until we come to these two near the end, or at the end, really. So Indag, who turns up in a triad as one of Arthur's mistresses, and his three concubines were Indeg, daughter of Garwi the Tall, and Garwin, daughter of Henin the Old, and Gul, daughter of Gendaud, Big Jaws. Okay. So I guess it's fine for him to be unfaithful. Why am I not surprised? This actually follows on from Triad 56, Arthur's three queens, all called Gwen Weaver. So we have Gwen Weaver, the daughter of a leader of Gwent. Gwen Weaver, the daughter of Gwither. Remember, he's the guy who fights Gwen Apneith. And then we have Gwen Weaver, the daughter of a giant. Mm, bit like old one. So this trebling is interesting. It, I don't think it makes her a triple goddess necessarily, but it certainly suggests a magical aspect to her. There's one final famous woman on the list, Morvid, daughter of Irian, who's Owain's sister twin sister. And the story of their birth is told in Triad 70. Womb burdens means multiple births. Three fair womb burdens of the island of Britain, Irian and Everthal, the children of Kinvark the Old, who were carried together in the womb of Nevin, daughter of Brychin, their mother. The second, Owain, son of Irian, and Morvid, his sister, who were carried together in the womb of Modron, daughter of Avathach, and the third, Gurgi and Peredir, and Kendrich Penasgeth, children of Elifer of the great warband, who were carried together in the womb of Evrithel, daughter of Kinvark, their mother. So you can see a line of descent here. Irian and Evrithel are twins. Irian is the father of the twins, Owain and Morvid. And then his twin sister, Evrithel, is the mother of Gurgi and Peredir and Kendrick. Now, it's possible that there was a tendency to multiple births in this family, but these were also considered very magical, multiple births. So a lot of heroes and deities are said to be twins, or occasionally triplets. And there's a lot of mythologizing around this family. There are quite a few variants on this triad. In one, poor Evrithel uh, not only bears triplets, but also a magical horse and a magical cow. So the story of how Irian came to impregnate the goddess Modron, the daughter of Avathach, is also Wonderful, but you'll need to sign up for my Tales of the Old North class for that one. Morvid, the twin sister of Owain, also turns up in Triad 71. Three lovers of the island of Britain, Cunan, son of Clidno, or Morvid, the daughter of Irian. So here she's paired with Cunan ap Clidno. He's a Gododan warrior from the ruling family in Edinburgh at the time. And he's one of the few who supposedly survived the famous Godothan battle at Catraith. We often see him in the company of Owain in the Arthurian romances, as if there's a long-remembered, half-forgotten connection of some kind between them. I wonder whether Cunan and Morviv managed to get married. So tomorrow we'll go on with our story. I've always wanted to spend time looking at the court list, and I appreciate your indulgence in keeping me company for three days as we did that. If you haven't watched the first two episodes of this season, you might want to do that before you watch tomorrow's episode so that you understand how the story started. I've begun putting the episodes into a playlist now, and I'll post the link to the playlist every day just to make it easier for you to find everything. Now, here comes today's question. On day three, I asked you about what motivation might have been for the creation of the court list. What's the point of a 2000 word list of names? And you came through with some really interesting answers. I'd encourage people to have a look at those. My question now is, having spent time getting to understand the list better or having it inflicted on you by me, did you find it interesting or valuable at all? Did you feel tempted to look up any of the names in the resources I gave you? 
Did you actually maybe follow through and look someone up? So you don't have to answer all those questions individually if you don't want to. Just let me know how interesting or worthwhile you find this strange corner of the story. Maybe tell me on a scale of one to 10 if you want to. And I won't be offended or think ill of you if you give it a one or a zero. You don't have to like it just because I do. So I hope you'll come back tomorrow for episode six as we finally find out what happens next to Kilhoek. Bye for now. If you're enjoying this series, why not take one of my online classes? There's almost always something on offer. Some classes have tiered to pay what you can pricing, and there are usually a few scholarships available for the more expensive classes. To get notifications about classes and about scholarships when they're announced, you can go to my website and subscribe to my newsletter or follow me on my Patreon page.